All right, so our next presenter is Dr. Wayne Walt. Um, Dr. Walt works at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and is the project leader for the e-extension UAS and Agriculture Learning Network and has developed a research and extension program on the application of UAS in agriculture and natural resources at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Specific areas of research and education include UAS deployment and flight operations, performance characterization of autonomous navigation systems, sensor system development, sensor integration, and information management. He has a private pilot certificate and has been conducting flight operations for three years within the context of FAA-issued certificates of authorization, uh, more commonly known as COAs. In addition, he has developed and delivered numerous extension educational programs on unmanned aircraft in agriculture. So welcome, um, Dr. Walt. I'll pass on the presentation to you now. Well, uh, thank you, Victor, and um, thank you, Ian. Uh, I think we'll find this presentation is going to shift gears a little bit. And actually, this is one of the really interesting things about unmanned aircraft and agriculture is a diversity of the opportunities to explore and develop uh, research and education. Um, so this afternoon, what I'd like to visit with you a little bit about here is some of the work we've been doing on uh, characterization of flight performance of unmanned aircraft. And uh, my uh, co-authors on this uh, work are noted here. Again, as Ian mentioned, uh, you do tend to find um, multidisciplinary efforts because of the nature of the technology. Well, um, as Ian mentioned, I'm going to follow a little bit on, on Ian's uh, nice introduction here. Um, remote sensing has been of great interest to agriculture. It gives that uh, bird's eye view that is so valuable as a uh, individual is trying to work with a large parcel of land. And um, we're seeing a uh, emerging high level of interest in bringing unmanned aircraft as a part of the remote sensing suite for agricultural and natural resources. Uh, Ian mentioned the, the crop monitoring. Uh, we're also seeing interest in livestock monitoring, uh, water resources management, even ecological surveying and inventorying. And uh, unmanned aircraft offer really unique solutions to uh, many of the challenges that we face in management of complex agricultural systems. So if we think of unmanned aircraft systems as really a sensor platform and look at them from that point of view in which we deploy multi-array sensors from a unique and advantageous perspective, we can kind of get to the, uh, the core concept behind unmanned aircraft. And if we're going to use them as a uh, sensor platform, then we may want to understand a little bit about the dynamics and performance characteristics of that platform so we can understand more about the uh, sensor itself and the way it's working. And then in the longer run, where we might head with this is more optimal flight planning and uh, perhaps even spending less time per acre in the field collecting all that uh, valuable and important data. So for uh, the work that Part of the work that we had been uh, developing here was to uh, work toward optimal strategies for deployment of unmanned aircraft systems platforms. And those strategies are based on flight performance and profile of the unmanned aircraft, so the aircraft itself, in combination with the sensor system and the sensor operational characteristics. Because as we start to merge these together, we now have a integrated system. Towards that goal then, the research objectives were to assess flight performance for a fixed wing unmanned aircraft system following an agricultural mission type of profile. And uh, here we're looking at fixed wing um, uh, because of, as Ian mentioned, the long flight duration and the ability to survey larger parcels of land. Um, we think this is going to be an important element of unmanned aircraft in agriculture, and it'll likely work hand-in-hand -hand with the multi-rotor type of technologies. Fixed wing might be thought of as more of a surveillance level kind of work, getting a bigger picture over a larger area, 
And then the uh, multi-rotors coming in is more of a diagnostic type of mission to zoom in and get a little closer into uh, specific areas. So for the uh, fixed wing system then, we wanted to explore and develop quantitative measures of flight performance. The three that I'd like to visit about this afternoon are the ability of the aircraft to follow a specific flight path, the ability to hold a given airspeed, and the ability to maintain a set altitude. So these are three uh, characteristics and we explored each one of them. In this case the aircraft that uh, we're working with is a uh, Tempest uh, by uh, UAS USA and the uh, it's combined with the Black Swift autopilot and uh, ground control station. Um, here we have the uh, ground control station here that has a Samsung tablet that we use to interface with the uh, Tempest aircraft here. The uh, airframe itself, is uh, the Tempest, has about a 10 and a half foot wingspan, has a, a 10 to 15 pound payload. Um, that varies uh, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the weight of the battery. You can put in different uh, capacities of battery or fuel cells. Um, it's able to fly an easy uh, 40 mile per hour cruise speed, that's air speed. Um, about a one and a half hour flight duration. Uh, it's powered by a 2.3 horsepower motor, and it has the normal kind of aircraft types of uh, uh, control surfaces, an elevator, a rudder, flaps for landing, and then ailerons for uh, turning or rolling the aircraft. Now, as we look forward to... Um, integrating sensors into the airframe, we need to be thinking about uh, the altitude that we're going to be flying. So, for example, uh, maybe 100 meters above ground level. Uh, we do have to stay below 400 foot AGL to meet our uh, Certificate of Authorization requirements. And then we also want to think about the sensor and the sensor field of view. And uh, combining these factors, uh, we start to get insights into how we would go about laying out our uh, flight plan to cover the area that we wish to cover for our given mission. Now here's an example of a uh, proposed uh, strategy for covering a field. The field here is noted by the four corners here. I'm just kind of mapping them out with a pointer. And then we might start, just as an example, here in the southwest corner and fly to the north along that west, or west boundary, uh, overfly the field, because the fixed-wing airplanes don't turn on a dime, as we might say, like the uh, multi-rotors. So we do overfly, and then we come back around. We start turning again to the south here. Now we're entering our field that we're interested in, carry over and turn come here to the west and then turn back north, but in this case we turn to the north uh, a bit sooner. So we, we kind of uh, create this additional path now a little bit to the east of our original path and that gives us overlap on our, uh, our sensors. This is sometimes called a racetrack pattern um, and it's, uh, it's fairly commonly used. There's also another pattern that's sometimes called a lawnmower pattern in this case, the unmanned aircraft might go up, uh, uh, make a turn, and then come back right down next to the former flight line. Um, that creates, for fixed wings, that creates pretty tight turns typically, and we don't want to put the aircraft into that type of flight regime, so we do uh, more gentle turns, broader turns, and come back down through the middle of our field. Okay, so that's kind of the strategy for uh, these, uh, the fixed wing approach. And then we take our, uh, our sensor information, our, our field of view, and start to lay out the plan in the um, uh, autopilot. And here we have uh, a field, and let's say the actual corners of the field are start here at uh, GPS point number two. I'm moving up to number three all the way over here looks like 62 and then down to 63. 
So this would be the actual area of interest, and the additional waypoints then are, are, are uh, overflights that allows the aircraft to move beyond the field of, that we're interested in and make the turn and come back. So this is kind of the strategy. This is the layout. These are the uh, GPS waypoints. There is another factor here I wanted to point out. The zero waypoint is the home base, and then that home base has a, a loiter radius set about it. Um, here we see the, the loitering uh, flight path. And so the um, aircraft, once it's launched, will take off and then will go ahead and put it into a loiter where it simply flies around this home point and when we're ready then to fly the mission, we give it the command, and it goes ahead and starts and flies our mission that we're interested in. But this home point is also important because it's a part of the safety factor with fixed-wing systems. Um, this has a, a you know 40 mile an hour easy cruise airspeed and an hour and a half flight duration. Um, one of the safety factors built into this is a uh, what's called a heartbeat where the ground control station, noted here, is constantly sending a signal to the unmanned aircraft. And the unmanned aircraft is saying, okay, I'm receiving that signal, I know you're there, I'm happy, we're both happy, everything's good. But if the aircraft flies out here, and let's say it's out over here in the edges of the field and uh, something were to happen, um, and it doesn't receive that heartbeat anymore, it then goes into an automatic return to the home base and enters the loiter pattern and waits there on a program time basis until it's uh, taken over manually for a landing. If it's not taken over then after a, a set period of time, which is established within this these submenus here in the control panel, uh, it will go ahead and just um, slowly throttle back and land in kind of a uh, spiral a large diameter spiral landing. Okay, so um, we flew this out at our research farm. We flew uh, 40 acre and 80 acre parcels. Uh, we've also uh, flown 160 acre parcels. Um, I'm just going to report on the 40 and the 80 here today. Our target altitude was 100 meters above ground level which in the autopilot, everything is based on uh, elevation or altitude above mean sea level, so we set it at 475 meters MSL. Our target airspeed was 18 meters per second. And uh, we set, we tried different waypoint extensions. One was 183 meters on each end of the field, and then a 305 meter uh, waypoint extension. I uh, should mention that we also use that initial uh, uh, kind of uh, loitering as our uh, test loop and we fly that circle a number of times. Uh, we use 280 meter diameter uh, to gather winds aloft uh, velocity and direction. By flying that circle we can infer and, and estimate the wind velocity at altitude as well as the prevailing direction. So here's some results here. These are 40 acre. Um, the first one uh, on August 5th here, that was with a, uh, a short extension on the uh, flight plan. Um, let's see, I'm just going to grab my pointer here. Here we go. This was the shorter extension. Also a little bit windy. The dash line is uh, the uh, intended flight path. The solid lines are where the aircraft actually flew. And um, we are working in, in the... Uh, out in the real world and it can be fairly windy as well as uh, gusty as well as uh, thermals developing. We'll fly um, at the midpoint of the day where we have uh, thermal activity. So we're in some challenging environment and we do that on purpose to challenge the aircraft. Let's see, these are 80 acre parcels here um, with the longer uh, overflight noted before, and uh, we can see there's some uh, degree of wavering here. I'm pointing on the September 22nd. We see some kind of uh, waffling of the aircraft as it seeks its um, next waypoint and is also being impacted by winds and gusts. This is just what we were looking for, though. We wanted to get an idea of uh, 
uh, you know, how these things are handling in the uh, kind of flight re uh, conditions we'll experience. Um, as with any research, we'll want to take a look at these results, not just visually, but uh, statistically. So we looked at uh, computing some averages of our uh, errors, um, standard deviations, root mean square, min max deviations, our mean error and tolerance level analysis. And just briefly, um, we have here uh, a uh, longitudinal tracking capability indicated airspeed and our ability to hold uh, altitude. Um, wind speed and direction are noted here for the given days. Uh, six meters per second uh, wind from the uh, east-southeast, 174 degrees on the compass. And uh, in the first longitudinal tracking we don't really have uh, mean values because we were dealing with our, our coordinates, but we do have a mean error here. For example, uh, in this case, minus 5.6 uh, uh, meter error, mean error. And we assigned uh, any time the flight plan was to the left of the intended uh, flight plan or flight line, then it was a negative. To the right of that uh, intended flight line was a positive. Um, we also have our root mean square error noted here. Uh, 14, uh, 5.7, 3.8 meters, and 4.3 meters. Um, indicated airspeed, uh, our target was 18 meters per second. We can see we were pretty close to that. In each case, we were just a little bit over our, in, our target indicated airspeed. Um, root mean square error, I kind of like to look at this because we don't really deal with positive and negative then um, in that analysis. Uh, 1.7, uh, 0.8 uh, meter per second, 1.6, and 1.4. Um, mean sea level, our ability to hold altitude. Our mean altitude uh, performance was real well. You can see this, 475 target. We were almost spot on with that. But we did have uh, variations around that. Our standard deviation noted here. Um, root mean square in this case is essentially identical to our standard deviation. Um, so it's uh, our, our max deviation is probably more telling here. We're up uh, on the order of uh, what uh, 11 meters above and 6 meters below, just almost 7 meters below our intended altitude. So on this particular day, August 5th, we were get the aircraft was getting blown around quite a bit. I should also note that we use the short uh, extensions, and that really put some uh, interesting uh, flight dynamics into the aircraft as it tried to make those turns in a real tight uh, radius. Another analysis that we did was um, the uh, tolerances for longitudinal tracking indicated airspeed and our altitude hold. And in this case, we set different tolerances. So for example, plus or minus two meters. And we asked what percentage of the time was the aircraft within plus or minus two meters of where we wanted it to be. And of course, as we increase that tolerance up to 15 meters, we start to see everything is almost every, you know, every uh, point is within our tolerance. Um, airspeed here, same kind of uh, approach. We set thresholds all the way up from a uh, half meter per second to holding airspeed at two meters per second. Um, as we increase that tolerance, we increase our frequency that we're within, and then our ability to hold altitude. Again, the same type of approach with different uh, intervals. Now these all come into play because uh, as our airspeed changes, the, remember the aircraft is moving in air, which itself is a fluid, um, and if you know our, our sensor is triggering and we're wanting to take images of the crop, for example, um, the ability to hold that airspeed could be fairly important. Um, and it kind of depends on how we activate the trigger on the sensors. But uh, um, you know we're, we're looking at questions like should we be flying directly into the prevailing wind or perpendicular to it? We hear different. Uh, recommendations from different uh, vendors. So this is a kind of a, a question that we're asking. 
based on uh, these kinds of performance. Here's a plot of our altitude and our indicated airspeed. Um, here taking a uh, kind of a uh, just a, an ex exploded view of this center portion here, expanding it out. We see our mean sea level here is kind of oscillating. That's our altitude. And then our indicated airspeed is also oscillating. And they're somewhat related as the uh, um, indicate as the as the aircraft drops in altitude, in other words, its nose is going down, the airspeed is increasing as one would expect. It's getting faster and uh, the aircraft itself, the autopilot, will take steps to try to minimize that change in airspeed. But we still have oscillations. So just a brief summary of our results. Uh, we felt the longer flight extensions uh, resulted in better performance. There were uh, very real factors present in this in, in flying the aircraft. Um, we also varied airspeed just a little bit. We gave one try with a faster airspeed, uh, 22 meters per second, and it did not do very well. Um, it's interesting. Uh, uh, we we felt that the slower airspeed gave better performance. Um, again, the uh, target velocity was. Uh, was held pretty well. Um, we felt good on that. Altitude uh, did fairly well, but we're a little bit concerned on uh, the implications for all of these factors coming together and an ability to return uh, good imagery. Um, again, I mentioned the idea of adjusting flight plans uh, relative to prevailing winds. There may be some promise there. Um, we're also looking at analysis of the aircraft orientation data, the roll, pitch, and yaw, because that also comes into play on the sensor position. Um, integrating the uh, flight path and orientation with the sensor operation would be a, uh, a real plus. Starting to get this idea of optimizing, where the um, optimal flight strategy is dependent on the environmental conditions, and the uh, particular unmanned aircraft and sensor combination. We've done some expansion of the flights to 160 acres. Uh, that gets pretty good sized, uh, kind of parcel of land. And um, we're also looking to expand the work to other aircraft and sensor combinations. So this is part of the uh, new air laboratory um, where we're conducting research on uh, aircraft for precision agriculture, resource conservation, and producing uh, educational materials. As Ian noted, uh, these uh, projects don't uh, just come about uh, in, in kind of out of thin air. Um, there is a fair amount of support that comes along with these to, to make them happen, and some of these uh, 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 entities that have helped us are noted here, as well as the uh, the crew, the new air crew that helps keep this all going, keeps the airplanes up in the air and flying, and coming back to Earth safely. So with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up that portion of the presentation and just jump briefly into a short uh, update with the FAA. Um, as we know, that things are quite dynamic in the unmanned aircraft world, and uh, FAA keeps us all on our feet. In this case, I'd like to highlight a uh, new, uh, well, relatively new fact sheet, uh, State and Local Re Regulation of Unmanned Aircraft Systems. It was issued by FAA Office of Chief Counsel 